James Bevan. He's Chief Investment Officer at CCLA, where he oversees some $10 billion. James, good to see you again. Thanks good for coming in. So what are your expectations of U.S. earnings season? What is it likely to reveal about the health of corporate America? Well, there are a couple of issues. First of all, there is the revenue line. Uh, and I have to say that I think that industrials and discretionaries still are very optimistic in terms of the sales volumes right. that companies will be reporting. The other issue, of course, is what margins the company is making on those sales, what's happened to their profitability. Uh, and strangely to relate, analysts are still projecting that profitability is going to be rising over the year ahead. And I think the You're companies... You're talking about as a whole? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the companies will be guiding the market down in terms of expectations because what is very clear is that if the market is wrong footed by a set of companies results that company is sorely punished in terms of share price results. So you're talking about rising profitability then across the board in US earnings season specifically? A absolutely. What, what's driving that? An expectation that cost cutting is exceeding the downturn in sales volumes. I mean, we're still expecting, in aggregate, sales increases, but at a lower elevation than had previously been expected. And analysts mm. do believe that cost cutting will allow margins to go up, so the profitability will be magnified uh, as a percentage of overall revenue. And I have to say, I think that's wrong for the aggressive sectors of discretionaries and industrials, where most of the good news, and I think the people ought to be looking at the utilities, the defensives, the companies in the healthcare sector, as an example, where expectations are already very modest, the probability of downgrades mm. is low, and actually the chances of missing estimates now look really very constrained. All right. So talk to me a little bit then about financial stocks because we have some, well, some big issues that have been weighing on these companies, haven't we? I mean, not just we U.S. Do. banks, but European banks as well. You have an overall sort of slowing growth, global environment. You've got the European debt crisis and then regulatory changes as well. Well, I would divide yeah. the financials market into four camps. Right. I would say that there are the probable long-term global winners of the banking sector and I would put HSBC and Standard Chartered over here in Europe in that category because of Because of their exposure have, to emerging and, markets. And have very strong balance sheets. They've got oodles of capital, therefore they can develop progressive strategies to enhance mm. value for shareholders because there is still a lot of business to be done in a credit-starved world where liquidity and balance sheet strength is going to be very important. The second tranche in the financial sector will be the banks that are basically mm. in deep water. And I would say that is a lot of the banks because I think that we are in a period of deleveraging as opposed to a conventional recession. And therefore, I think the balance sheets of banks are going to remain stressed for an extended period. The third category would be the life assurance and general insurance companies, where I think there is excellent value, particularly in the Swiss participants in the market, where I think that value really has been trashed and that prices are now discounting a very large amount of good, uh, bad news. The fourth category are the specialist financials in the UK companies right. like Close Brothers, where I think the prospects are really very strong. I'm just wondering though, you, you say that many of the banks are in the weaker category Absolutely. or that, that could be in trouble and uh, well, I mean, are, how difficult is it because of this, because of a lack of clarity, if you like, in terms of their exposure to sovereign debt, how difficult is it to distinguish between the healthier banks and then those which may really be in trouble when it comes to investing. In Euroland it's clearly a big issue because we have the sovereign supporting the banks and we have the banks supporting the sovereigns and we don't yet have mm. a lender of last resort. And if one thinks about what is required to make sovereign debt AAA in a genuine sense, it is a lender of last resort. We do need the ECB to step up to the plate to assume that right. responsibility. Well, you know, actually I'd like to focus on a few European stocks other than the banks that you sure. single out, James, for special attention. Now, within pharmaceuticals, within that industry, you actually like like AstraZeneca, think that it will exceed expectations for earnings, cash flow and cash returns. Meanwhile, you're backing Danone to maintain the highest growth profile amongst the large cap food companies and telecoms. You think BT could do well, saying it promises a better return than its current depressed price would suggest. So, okay, tell us a little bit more about why you like those three companies okay. specifically. Three very AstraZeneca. different angles of what's going on in the market. In AstraZeneca's case, it's a question of quality growth at a ridiculously depressed price. And therefore, even if we allow for the risks of brilliant, which are well known by the market, so no ugly surprises yeah. in terms of patent expiry, in terms of what, what sales are likely to be. That's always a risk hanging over these companies. Well, it's, it's seven times projected growth of only seven percentage points and I think that that is bargain basement for a company where the credit default swap, the measure of riskiness of AstraZeneca is better than most sovereigns. In terms of Danone, I see very strong global growth opportunities. Danone obviously very significantly mm. exposed to emerging markets, a major player in both milk and water and 
protecting its margins, growing sales very aggressively. Two staples. So a genuinely good growth opportunity. Now, British Telecom, completely different kettle of fish, because I would absolutely put my hand up and say there is a company with well-known problems, big problems with its pension scheme, huge problems in terms of uh, remission, mm. particularly of the retail customer base. My challenge on BT bears is the extent to which all of the bad news, and more in my perspective, is already in the price. I see, a company, that it is. Well, I see a company yeah. that is delivering really very strong free cash flow of about 15 percentage points, capable of sustaining and growing its dividend from current levels. This environment, I think, has a home done. That outweighs the problems Absolutely. that they've been having. James Bevan, always good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Chief Investment Officer at CCLA Investment Management.